what we're trying to do is to take this big iron machine, this big MRI machine, and reduce it into a consumer electronics wearable. And that can transform medical imaging, and it can also transform the way we communicate with each other via brain. And, and let me take you on this journey and explain to you why I think so. I believe that we can put the functionality of that MRI system into a wearable, into a ski hat or a bandage or a bra or many different things that gives not just MRI resolution but read-write and higher resolution at massively lower cost. Not just in 10x lower cost like with one laptop per child, but at scale f 1,000 times cheaper, which can be really transformative. And so why does that dovetail not just with medical imaging but understanding our brains? because our brains are part of our body. So if we can see inside of our body, we can see inside of our brains. And there's a lot of great work that I'm gonna share with you tonight by these amazing neuroscientists using functional magnetic resonance imaging scanners. Those are like the video form of MRI, showing all kinds of things that we can communicate by just lying inside of, um, of these machines. So the National Academies have said of the top five, uh, of most, the National Academies of most developed countries have said of the top five things you can do as a technologist, reverse engineering the brain is one of those things. And so the question is, you know, how do you do that? So in the last two and a half years, I'm not a neuroscientist. I've talked to a lot of neuroscientists. Any neuroscientist worth their salt will tell you, we don't even know what a thought is. Like, we, well, you know, it's sort of like pornography. You know it when you see it, but we don't know what it is. And this whole issue boils down to something they call causal versus non-causal. You have about 100 billion neurons in your brain, each of them with 100,000 possible connections. And the, it just seems intractable to track that. And that's just the neurons, let alone the glia and whatever's happening in your gut and the hormones and all of this stuff going on. And then there's the non-causal approach, where you just do a, a top-down approach, which is really, I think, what's happened with some of the, both the implant solutions and the fMRI solutions. And so I think that there's this context that, that you know, the bottoms-up approach is pretty cool, but the top-down approach is also pretty cool, and hopefully we meet in the middle. And so I want to talk to you about a little bit about what's been done with fMRI. In 1991, got the cover of Science, uh, a group at Harvard Mass General Hospital was able to show that the blood flow of your brain as measured in an fMRI machine could show whether you were looking at an image or not. First thing, amazing. Oh my gosh, can we use fMRI to see thoughts? Well, if we fast forward a number of years later, I became aware of this work. This is the work of Professor Jack Gallant at, at University of California at Berkeley. And he started working with lab rats and then macaques and then moved up to using graduate students as lab rats <laughs> and put them in MRI scanners for hundreds of hours and made them watch YouTube videos while recordings were made of their minds lighting up or not lighting up, area by area. What fMRI measures is oxygen use by looking at the color change or the change of blood properties, whether it's carrying oxygen or not under a, two, two, under a huge magnetic field. And by looking at, at that and creating a library, if you will, of students reacting to hundreds of hours of YouTube videos, um, then a new clip was shown called the presented clip here. And the computer, using the scan data, inferred what it thought the student was looking at. And the result is a grainy image of what the student was looking at. And I saw this and I'm like, oh my gosh. We just have to lower the, the size of the device and up the resolution and, and there you go. And I tried, <laughs> I tried to get Google to fund this. I tried to get Facebook. But anyway, I am doing it now. I'm a startup. So it's been a long haul. Um, and uh, you know, also there's this Japanese group who went even further. They put the graduate students in the MRI machines and woke the students up a couple of minutes after they fell asleep Ask them what they were dreaming about to make a video of your dreams so that you can dump your dreams in an MRI scanner to the computer. It's totally cool. 
This is um, back to uh, UC Berkeley, and um, with less than 5% um, false positive threshold, by looking at an area or a signature of your brain, we can predict a word cloud of words you're thinking, in this case, numbers. In another case, um, there's, a, there's a violence area, a sex and violence area, so you could actually in the future imagine turning that filter down if you didn't wish to communicate thoughts of sex and violence now that you know, you're hooking your brains up with each other. So this is pretty cool stuff. And um, there's, there's some work done. This work is uh, a decade ago. This is just a very fast path through fMRI. Uh, where uh, the students were shown a thousand images and the computer could, if the students were shown each of the thousand images just twice, with 80% accuracy, the fMRI machine and the computer could decide or guess or infer what the student, what student, what the images the student was looking at. And just to be clear, through random guess with a thousand images, that's a 0.1% chance of happening. This is pretty stunning how accurate you can get in certain control in certain situations just using fMRI. So then there's a lot of work that's gone on with, with brain implants. And it's got to be pretty tough for you to have the brain implant. Um, has anybody ever had um, brain surgery in the room? I have. Okay. So, I'm the only startup doing brain-computer communication that's not doing impl implants. I had a non-elective brain surgery in 1995 to stay alive. I take a dozen medications every day to live. You're going to do that if it's that or death. But I just don't see a billion people having elective brain surgery anytime soon. It's the hardest thing I ever did in my life. But yet, you know, here's a case at Brown University my alma mater, where a woman was a paraplegic. They gave her an implant, and for the first time, she could give herself a drink with a robot arm. Totally cool. So if you've got a condition where, you can't, where you're locking or you can't move, I totally see it. There's been this amazing work done with electrode probes where 500 neurons were activated in this, in this primate, and with those 500 neurons activating the, with the electrical pulses, the primate could play the video game and do pretty well. And then they, they, gave, they, they hooked three primates together, each with 500 neuro, 500 electrodes. And the three primates played the video games a lot better, <laughs> which is really kind of interesting if you think of where that, where that might lead with sharing our minds. And so the bet we're making, I'm making, is that the massively more data we enable by putting a, a, a two-ton magnet that's the most expensive room in the hospital that costs a few million dollars, that has liquid helium to cool it and a power plant to run it, and the magnetic shielding and no metal and all of that, if we put that into a wearable, we can get massively more data. Um, higher resolution, uh, which I'm going to talk about how with better temporal response, and we also have found, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, non-invasive, actually direct neuron read-write, and uh, better hierarchical uh, algorithms that we think we can develop with this. Non-causally, sort of top-down, meeting the bottom-up people who are saying, we don't know what a thought is, there's 100 billion neurons, each with 100,000 different connections. We hear you, we also think it's important to come top-down. <laughs> 